Thank you for tuning in to the Hope, Strength, Courage podcast. Love and support for parents whose kids are fighting for their lives. A weekly podcast created to support parents and caregivers of children diagnosed with cancer, where you will find resources collected to help you face each day with hope, strength, and courage. From interviews with the top experts in their fields, doctors, psychologists, chaplains, and insp inspiring frontline workers in pediatric oncology as they share their best advice, as well as day-to-day -day advice it collected from other cancer moms and leaders in personal growth and development. From individuals who understand how hard it can be, I hope you will feel better prepared to cope with the day-to-day -day challenges of caring for your child. Hi, I am Laura Lane, and I am your host. My own daughter, Celeste, was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 12. In 2015, I wrote about our experiences in the book, Two Mothers, One Prayer, Facing Your Child's Cancer with Hope, Strength, and Courage. Since that time, I have dedicated thousands of hours to share with other parents and caregivers the resources, tools, tips, and skills and strategies I learned that helped our family stay happier, healthier, and more hopeful. My goal is to share with you my interviews with experts to support you as you care for a child with cancer. Today's episode features part one of my interview with Dr. Jeff McCowage, a pediatric oncologist at the Children's Hospital of Westmead in Sydney, Australia. I love in this interview how Dr. McCowage shares his love for the world of pediatric oncology, the dynamic healthcare teams working alongside each other for the benefit of children and families, and how much they are there to serve you and want to support you through this trying time. I hope you will find this interview as interesting as I did. Today I'm interviewing Dr. Jeffrey McCowage. Dr. Jeff is a pediatric oncologist at the Children's Hospital at Westmead in Sydney, Australia. He is a principal investigator for clinical trials within the Children's Oncology Group. He has a particular clinical interest in neuro-oncology and sarcomas of bone and soft tissue. He has been an attending pediatric oncologist for 20 years. As Dr. Jeff, he hosts a podcast that is aimed at parents of children with cancer. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Jeff, today. I'm really glad to have you with us. It's a pleasure, Laura. Thanks for having me. It's morning here in Sydney. Oh, right. um, yes. And at mid-winter, mid it's bitterly cold. We're all suffering extremely. It's, uh, you know, 60 degrees outside, <laughs> you know, but we're, we're, we're really struggling. Well, as but a Canadian, I can't, uh, I can't relate as a Canadian. <laughs> I'm sure you can. I'm sure you experience cold, even as cold as this sometimes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we get to pass through that range of temperature every spring and every fall. Okay. But it doesn't stay there very long. <laughs> okay. Perhaps I'm not going to get much sympathy out of you and your audience. Yeah. So hopefully there'll be others in the south of the United States who can understand. So. Perhaps. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear more about you. What drew you to the field of pediatric oncology? And what is it that you love about serving in this area? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I get asked that one a lot. And... Uh, I guess people imagine that perhaps when I was 17 years old, I had this dream one day to be a pediatric oncologist. But really, in my case, I sort of got there stepwise. So you come out of medical school and then you end up in Australia. You do a couple of years in adult medicine. And, you know, I decided that wasn't really for me. And then uh, so I went over and tried pediatrics and I really liked pediatrics. And then in pediatrics, you're uh, dealing with uh, dangerously ill children sometimes and uh, less dangerously ill children sometimes. But bit by bit, you get part and part of, part of the pediatric thing and uh, you find that it works for you and it, you can deal with the dramas and the emotion and you have something to contribute. And then I found myself doing a rotation through pediatric oncology and I don't know, I, I really just loved it from the first time I did it. I think um, a couple of things. One is that it's, a, it's an area of medicine where one has a long-term relationship with patients and families. Right. So rather than 
seeing them once with an episode of gastroenteritis and, and that's it. Uh, it's more a case of uh, seeing the patients and families and ha having a long-term relationship and working with them and getting to know them and all of that. Mm -hmm. So there was that. The other thing I'd say about paediatrics is, you know, in general paediatrics, you treat people with gastroenteritis, for instance, and it might be a little baby and they might be dehydrated. And you know what? They can be critically ill. And if they don't get a drip and an IV fluid started, well, it's life-threatening. You know, they can die. So these are very important things to treat mm -hmm. and, and treat them we do. But at an intellectual and academic level, it gets a bit, uh, I don't know, a bit repetitive maybe and a bit less intellectual and challenging. It's mm -hmm. life-saving. It's vital. I'm glad people do it. But I, I felt that. Uh -huh. And... Um, and I think I like working in a big academic centre rather than being out in private practice and so on. So that appealed to me. And then there's all the science in it as well. But I think more it was the the the, the emotion and and the 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 sense that these people are really in need. This is a terrible thing, and uh, I, I think that attracted me more than you know the DNA and the you know, molecular aberrations and all that stuff. Yeah. So I think that's sort of how you get there. It was more a bit by bit. Medicine, then paediatrics, then paediatric oncology, and then here I am. Mm -hmm. So tell us, what is it like to be working on the paediatric oncology unit? Um, what's it like working with that team of doctors and nurses and other staff? And how is that different from working on other units? Okay, so... Well, look, I love it. It suits me down to the ground. Um, so what's the alternative? Well, you might be in uh, general paediatrics or I don't know what you would call it, family paediatrics, uh, general paediatrics, maybe with a private rooms or a private surgery out in the suburbs somewhere with a secretary and a nurse and seeing patients after each other and then maybe ha having admitting rights to the hospital and going up there and seeing kids with asthma and seizures and meningitis and gastroenteritis. And I guess that's more how general paediatrics might work. Mm -hmm. um, on the contrary, paediatric oncology, so childhood cancer treatment is, is concentrated in the big academic medical centre and we have a huge team of people all playing their role. Mm -hmm. And so I quite like having all these other people around me. I quite like having all these junior doctors that I'm working with who are learning first about paediatrics and then as fellows about paediatric oncology. Mm -hmm. I like a bunch of nurses who are experienced and committed and, you know, have been there for years and years and I rely on them enormously, uh, you know, their judgments that, you know, that something isn't right here. Right. You know, this isn't what we usually do and, uh, you know, very valued. We have pharmacists and we have social workers and psychologists and dietitians and whole lots of people and uh, then we have very expert people in all the other departments, you know, the radiologists are, are reporting the MRI scan and I can go over there and look at the scan with them and talk over it and then go to pathology and hear what the biopsy shows and, you know, get a sense of the pathologist's view of it or is the pathologist worried about, I'm not quite sure what this is and do we have to do other tests and, you know, the, the expertise is very important but it's the relationships as well. You have to know who you're talking to and, and uh, they have to know you and they have to put up with your weird eccentricities <laughs> when they feel confident and when they don't or, yeah. you know, and it's really a dynamic and uh, stimulating area and, you know, and also to be working with a bunch of people who are seriously committed to what they're doing. You know, none of them are there for the big bucks, you know, mm -hmm. an awful lot of them could make a lot more money going out into private practice and reporting on, you know, the knees of people with arthritis, you know, their MRI scans, but no, they're all there for, to, for a noble cause, I would suggest, and, and so it's great. I love it. So it's that incredible sense of team. and that That's that. right. That's right. There is this great team thing, and I guess, unashamedly, I'm sort of one of the bosses in the team, and, uh, well, I quite like that, and, mm -hmm. but it's not a dynamic where you can boss people around. A lot of them have expertise in their area that it way surpasses your own. And so while I have a, a leadership role in the department more broadly, but in an individual patient's care, definitely, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to be prepared to listen to them all and hear what they've got to say and, and uh, 
you know, let them tell tell you when they think you're wrong and, and right. so on. Yeah, mm-hmm. a great team. That's very good. And so, and so what I'd say to families and to parents who, you know, have just been told, look, your child has cancer or leukemia or a tumour, and, you know, and they're going to embark on this treatment, well, I'd stress to them that there's a whole lot of people out there that are there to look after you mm-hmm. and your child, and they're seriously committed people. From the, um, you know, the, the head honcho professor to the, the ward clerk or even the porter, you know, people mm-hmm. get to know these families. They get to know these children and, and, uh, they're all there for, for you. They're there to, to help. Um, it's not like, you know, when you go to see a doctor, I don't know, in Canada quite how it's like, but if I went to see a, a doctor. Suppose I was just a regular person, went to see him for my arthritis in my knee. You know, you have the appointment mm-hmm. and then you get the referral letter and you turn up and you sit in the waiting room. Everyone's very polite and then you get called and then you see them and then mm-hmm. have the consultation and then you go and it's, it's all pretty structured and you don't, you know, feel like you can just phone up the next day and say, oh, now what you were saying about my knee, you know, can we talk about that more? Well, you know, that's sort of most people's image of going to see doctors, I think. Mm-hmm. So the dynamic here is a very different one. This is a team that's there for you. There's all sorts of people with their parts to play and they want to be there for you and they want to be very flexible. You know, some of the treatments we have to use are pretty strong and toxic and have side effects. And I want to know that the parents feel completely free to phone if something's wrong, if their child seems unwell. If they think the child's toenails look funny and they don't know what it means, I want them to call. I'm relying on the parents to be in touch with our team. Tell us when things are odd or unusual. And sometimes we'll say, yeah, that's no problem. And sometimes we'll say, no, that's a problem. So I really want parents to feel free to be in touch with the unit and to be talking to us. And at 2 a.m., if there's a fever, you've got to call. Everyone's there for you. You know, we're all worried about the side effects of these drugs. We'll be nervous if we think you're not going to be in touch. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's what I'll encourage. Feel, think of it as a, a dynamic where you can call on help from various different quarters. And, you know, most units will have, a, you know, a structure for who do you call, you know, who are you going to call when things yeah. are worrying, you know, whether it's the children's ward or the, you know, the consultant attending on call or the fellow or who. They'll have systems. Use them. Mm-hmm. So from what I'm from what I'm hearing from you, there's two things that one the parent should not say, oh I don't want to bother anyone, because absolutely, the, absolutely, you're not bothering anyone. Yeah. We get bothered when people don't contact us when right. something was wrong. When we hear that the child had a fever in the night of 39, but he looked all right, we didn't want to bother you. That freaks us out totally. We want to we want to hear about it. Now, do I personally need to hear about it every time? No, I want the unit to hear about it and to respond. And everyone's drilled and knows how to respond. Mm -hmm. So none of this, I don't want to bother the doctors or the nurses or the anyone. We want to be bothered. Right. Sorry, that a second thing. Yeah, Yeah, so then the second thing was don't try and figure it out yourself. Let you make this or your team make the decision on whether it's good or bad. If you think it's different, just let them make the decision. That's right, that's right. Now, you know, there's limits, of course, you know, that, you know, Someone with a mosquito bite, no, you don't have to be in touch. But, yeah, things that seem odd, you know, these are very complicated medical situations we find ourselves in where we're treating a cancer and, you know, very often we have the cancer improving and shrinking or going into remission, but we're still throwing around some, you know, pretty strong drugs with complicated side effects and, uh, uh, you know, I don't expect the, you know, the the general doctors in the emergency department to have very good familiarity with these things. Mm-hmm. So very much I don't want parents sort of dwelling on it and Googling it and trying to work out, well, what should we do? I, you know, call on the experts. And mm-hmm. if if three quarters of the time we say, oh, it's nothing, don't worry, that's okay. Don't feel, oh, I disturbed them for no good reason. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah, terrific. Okay. okay, so my next question for you is what key advice would you give to parents of children with cancer? What are the things that they they should be doing, the things, just important information you think that they should know? All right, so so let's imagine that we're right at the start and uh, 
the child has just been found to have cancer or leukemia. Mm -hmm. um, okay, worst day of your life, undeniably. Uh, mm -hmm. Terrible, totally shell-shocked, totally devastated. And that's why we're going to tell you the same things five times over. In the case of one time, you'll remember it. Well, so we're going to embark on treatment for this cancer or leukemia. And your doctors will need to advise you about whether this is a form of cancer where we should be being optimistic that eventually we'll cure the disease. Mm -hmm. Or is it one where, you know, we can't be as optimistic or even is it one where we can't be very optimistic at all? Right. So you need to get that from your doctors. Um, this is not one to Google and look at. Um, first off, childhood cancer is a totally different thing to adult cancer. They're totally different cancers, and even when they've got the same name like lymphoma, childhood lymphoma is different to adult lymphoma. So you really need to get that from the doctors. But with all, but keep in mind that you know something like eighty percent or more of children with cancer will be cured. Um, if you're looking at the sort of developed world, Canada, Australia, the US, Britain, France, you know, all those countries, it's, it's over 80% that will be cured. But, you know, you've got one child and you don't want them 80% cured, you want them 100% cured. So get the information from your doctors. But in any event, we're going to go down a path of treatment and almost always that involves chemotherapy, and for some tumors, there'll be an operation or there may be radiation, but there will be chemotherapy usually. And I've got to say that, you know, we achieve this 80% plus by using chemotherapy. And we throw it around in pretty solid doses, pretty high doses. And uh, we expect to get all sorts of side effects. In, in fact, you know, if we didn't get many side effects, we probably put the dose up until we did. <laughs> because higher doses very often are the key. So... You know, it's going to be a rough ride most of the time. Again, get your doctors to tell you, is this going to be the sort of minimalist chemotherapy or something medium, or is it going to be full on acute myeloid leukemia, mm -hmm. bone marrow transplants, things like that. Yeah. But whatever it is, it's going to be a way worse time than you've probably ever experienced. It is going to be a tough time. It's probably going to be the worst year of your life. All right? So I would be honest and say that. Um, and if you can adjust to that, then I think maybe you can handle it better. Okay. Now, a few things I'd try to discard right at the outset right, are some of the negative emotions that you might carry with you. So, first off is the question of why did my child get cancer? And, uh, you know, and often parents feel guilty, you know, their child got cancer and it's something they did. It's what we fed the child. It's what we... You know, I smoked when I was pregnant or I drank or, uh, you know, it's TV, it's where we live, it's, you know. I've got to say that it, I struggle to think of a single lifestyle factor that is associated with childhood cancer, okay? Mm -hmm. Smoking and adult cancer, definitely. You know, not enough fibre in the diet, you know, drinking. Pretty much anything that's fun in adults seems to be linked with getting cancer. Uh, <laughs> But in childhood, it's not about lifestyle. It's nothing you did. It's not from anything you did. It's not your fault that the child has cancer. Mm -hmm. And it's no one else's fault either. It's not what your husband or wife or partner did. It's, it's not their fault. It's no one's fault. Be angry at the universe. Be angry at God, if you like. Be angry. But don't be angry at yourself or at others. Don't harbour that emotion. Mm -hmm. The next thing to say is, well, you might be angry at the doctors. You know, the doctor that you saw and you saw and you kept going back and you said something's wrong and he said, ah, oh, it's just a virus. And then, you know, and eventually you find it's a tumour. You know, you know, we hear this story all the time and, you know, I don't hold it against those doctors. Childhood cancer is rare. Uh, if, if family doctors mentioned cancer every time they saw a kid with a virus or a fever or a sore bone, um, I think their practice would dry up very quickly because it's rare. Mm -hmm. And the symptoms of cancer, they're often what you call non-specific. They're not, they're not things that, you know, cry out, this is cancer. They're things that cry out, 
This is a kid with some sore legs, probably, I don't know, growing pains, virus, something, okay? And, you know, also that delay in diagnosis that you get, it's not clear that that's going to impact the chances of curing the cancer, right? It's not like if they got to it sooner, we would have found it before the tumour spread to the lungs or something. We don't really think of it that way. More likely it's a tumour that's going to be one that spreads to the lungs from the outset, or it's not. It's not because the doctor took three months to work it out and then it spread. And, you know, ultimately what it's going to come down to is do the drugs work? Uh, that's what it will come down to. So don't be angry about some delays in diagnosis. And, uh, you know, it's not desirable and the child might be in a more parlous state by the time they get to you a bit sicker or maybe more unstable. But, you know, we get through that. And, and, and then it comes down to do the drugs work. Can the tumour be cut out sometimes? You know, all those things. And uh, so I wouldn't... Um, uh, come into this feeling guilty or angry or feeling blame um, and you've got to discard all of those things. The other thing you might worry about is, wow, my child has cancer, well, must be in the family, you know. Uh, what about the other kids? What about the cousins, the nephews, the nieces, all of them? And this is an area of very active research and I've got to say that, you know, it's only a small proportion of patients where there's some, you know, hereditary component to it, something you inherit from a parent or something that made them more likely to get the cancer. This is, this is rare. Now, you know, as DNA exploration happens, it's, we're, we're going to find more examples of it, I suppose. But, I mean, a big, big paper in the New England Journal, you know, 2015, they looked at this in great detail and, and I think they found about 8% of patients had some genetic abnormality, I mean hereditary type genetic abnormality, that um, made them more likely to get the cancer, 8%. And, you know, so that's the sort of figure, even that may be higher than it really is. So, so don't freak out, oh my goodness, all my other children need to be checked and the cousins and the nephews and the nieces. Right. Okay, so that's getting rid of some emotions at the outset. That was so refreshing to hear such down-to-earth, behind-the-scenes advice from Dr. Jeff. To have that reassurance that our child's medical team is there to support and serve, and that we are not a burden to them, and that they are just as concerned about our child's welfare as we are. Please join me next week for part two of my interview with pediatric oncologist and podcast host, Dr. Jeff McCowage, as he shares his best advice for parents, and he tells us about the podcast he created specifically to support parents when their child is first diagnosed with cancer. And in the meantime, please check out Dr. Jeff's podcast, Understanding Childhood Cancer with Dr. Jeff, on your favorite podcast player. Before we end our show today, we have one last segment. Over the last few years, I have asked other cancer moms what advice they wish they had known when their child was first diagnosed. I have compiled that information and will be sharing their advice each week. You can download the top 101 pieces of advice that I put together as a mini ebook at twomothersoneprayer.com. Today's advice echoes one of Dr. Jeff's comments. This mom said, it isn't your fault. Her in-laws blamed her at one time for her daughter's leukemia. If we recall what Dr. Jeff said, childhood cancer isn't about the food our children eat. It's not about watching television. It's not where you live. It's not your fault, and it's not anyone else's either. So be angry at the universe or God if you must, but don't be angry with yourself or others. Thank you for sharing that. If you have advice you have learned along the way that you wish someone had told you weeks, months, or years earlier, I invite you to fill out the contact form on our website, twomothersoneprayer.com, and I will be sharing your advice with our listeners at future shows. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule today to listen to the Hope, Strength, Courage podcast. I look forward to sharing more experts and advice with you again next Wednesday. Please remember to take a minute to describe to subscribe to the show. Thanks also need to go out to our Hope, Strength, Courage production team, which consists of my wonderful assistant, Tracy Ogilvie McDonald, Andrew Braun at Braun Audio and Audio Geek, 
music by Fizz Anthony, social media support by Marife Constantino, and graphic design by Amy Hosmer. To learn more about myself, Laura Lane, and to order my book, please visit lauralane.ca.